uh, Edgar Torres, I'm chair of Latin American Latino Studies. I've been teaching at City College for the last 18 years. And uh, I guess maybe for about 14 of those years, I've been, been the chair of, uh, of, like I said earlier, Latin American Latino Studies. And I'm not Madeline Mueller. <laughs> um, I'm pinch hitting for Madeline. Uh, my name is Simon Hansen. I am a professor in the biology department from 2010 to 2016 during the college's accreditation crisis. I was the department chair of the biology department and I'm currently the first vice president of the academic senate and involved intimately right now with the budget committee and the planning committee and the inner workings of the college as far as finances go. Hence I thought I'd, thought I'd step up here if anyone has any questions. Yeah, no, I appreciate Simon being here. Madeline had a conflict and I'm sure he's Going to be an I'm going to channel Madeline, so I have some papers for you. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, man. you know, we wanted to find out, first of all, because you're a small group, how many are connected to City College in one way or another? How many are you teachers at City College who have taught in the past? And how many are students? And how many have some other kind of connection? Okay, because a lot of what we're doing, we don't think, I don't think that what's happening at City College is unique to City College. I feel like this is going on worldwide and particularly nationwide and we're just the uh, you know, source of a lot of the changes that are trying to be implemented. Um, I guess I was going to talk first and we're going to each try to talk for about 15 minutes and then take your questions and comments. And what I wanted to do was to give you the bigger picture and put it City College in the context of the bigger picture and then look at City College more in particular but a lot of what I say I think applies to what's going on in higher education throughout the country and but I'll use City College as my example because that's the one that I'm familiar with. So the bigger picture is that we live in a capitalist society and the purpose of education in a capitalist society as far as I'm concerned, we may have our differences, is to promote the interests of the dominant sectors of our society which is most importantly business interest. That that's what education is there for and to reproduce the existing class structure of our society at the same time changing as the conditions in the society changes but still re reproducing reinforcing our class structure and that's reflected in California's education system as far as I'm concerned we have three levels at the top are the UC's places like Stanford and Caltech and as far as I'm concerned their main job is to prepare those the students to be able to run the major institutions of our society in the future. The, and the students attending a place like the UCs or a place like Stanford mainly come from the upper middle class or upper class. And so again, their class position is being restructured. Of course, there are many exceptions to the students at these places. Um, the CSUs, the California State Universities, are there to train the, the lower middle class and the middle class for lower level positions as supervisors and managers and to train people with specific skills in fields such as accounting. And then the third level are the community colleges whose job is to provide skills that are required by businesses for their workforce. And so a lot of it is workforce training, and that may be the choice of the students, and for training people for lower supervisory positions. And of course at the community colleges, you know, give you a contrast, I think they're equally important, but the community college trains people to be nurses and firefighters, as opposed to the UCs and Stanfords are training our future doctors and lawyers. It's part of the, the difference in the classes. Um, just to give you an idea of this position for the community colleges, um, in terms of their training, training um, ex expectation. In the State of the Union address in 2014, Obama said that he wants to connect, and these are his words, connect companies to community colleges that can help design training to fill their specific needs. In other words, what he wanted, what his vision is, is that you have the businesses go to the community colleges. We need people trained in these particular skills design your programs to make sure that you've got people trained with these skills. That way, business doesn't pay for the training, so it saves them money, it's paid for by the public, and the ideal actually is to have a glut of these skilled workers. Why would they want a glut? Because then you can keep wages and salary low and make even more money. So that was Obama's vision for the community colleges, as far as I'm concerned. Um, 
Now, uh, community college also allow for upward social mobility. So there are high achieving students. Some of them will transfer to the UCs. You know, they, they represent what we call the American dream. So they help to reinforce that image about the country. They fulfill, those, those from the, say, the lower socioeconomic classes, working class people who actually move upwards are doing what Marx once referred to as, you know, we have a ruling class and they need their blood reinvigorated with, they need fresh blood reinvigorating their ranks all the time. And so that's the role of the social mobility for those who are doing very well and ex excelling at places like the community colleges. For many years, the corporate, what people call the neoliberal agenda, has been pushed on our educational system across the country. In California in particular, for the community colleges in 2011, uh, the corporate agenda was called the Student Success Task Force. You know, who could be against success? I assume everyone in here is in favor of success. And that corporate agenda wa was um, supported by City College as a creditor. They lobbied for it, perhaps improperly given their role, but they lobbied in favor of the Student Success Task Force. At City College, there were leaders at City College who opposed some of the elements of the Student Success Task Force, and they forced through some modifications to it. I can't give you specifics, but that was detrimental to the success of this program. Well, guess what? Six months later is when City College, for the first time, was sanctioned by the accreditors, the Accrediting Commission for Community and Junior Colleges, and then a year later threatened with closure. So they lobbied for it, then they sanctioned the college that represented the opposition to, to the Student Success Task Force. And they placed the first time City College on show cause. That is a sanction level that requires the college to prove why it should remain open. Which is very, and then a the year later they threatened closure. So the college is put in a position to prove why it should remain open. This is from their report that they utilize for sanctioning the college. This is some of the language that they use. Well, let me backtrack a minute. The U.S. Department of Education says that accreditation is supposed to see to it that the college offers acceptable levels of quality. Keep in mind that word acceptable. This is what the ACCJC had to say about City College in their report. The visiting team, quote, concluded that the instructional programs provide high quality instruction. In other words, we far exceeded the standard for the Department of Education. They also confirmed that the college provides comprehensive and accessible student services. They also said that the college is to be commended for its commitment to diversity and equity. The college's efforts to achieve equity and diversity are exemplary. I, I mean, does that sound like a college that should be shut down? I mean, to me, that's a college that should be celebrated. Now, there were problems that they had with the faculty not doing what's called student learning outcomes. I'll talk about that in a minute. And problems with the administration. So they are threatening the college because what they deem to be problems of the administration, but who pays the price for that? The students and the faculty and the staff. They're the ones, they're the ones victimized by what the accreditors saw as the flaws with the administration. So as far as I was concerned, this whole, th the ACCJC, the accreditors, created an unjustified crisis to push through this corporate agenda that includes transforming and downsizing the college. And this has been going on ever since the accreditation crisis started. It takes on different forms. You know, we've had one rogue authoritarian administration after another, you know, all whom have been attempting to implement this. And, and again, this is going on a statewide and national level. It's part of the corporate agenda. So let me describe the corporate agenda. And again, much of this applies to City College. One part of it is to do more with less. So we're going to give you fewer resources, but you better do a hell of a lot more in terms of educating students and serving the functions that we want you to carry out. They always talk about these days, we hear the chancellor repeating over and over again, we need to increase our productivity. Now, for a corporation, that may sound good, but what does that mean for education? That basically means we need to process more students through our classes. In other words, we have to have bigger classes. And one of the big benefits of community colleges is the fact that you have smaller classes. You don't have, like the UCs, with five, 600 students in an introductory class. You actually have classes in which this, the faculty member can learn things about the student and know them on a much more personal level. And everybody will say, 
every educator that I've ever come across will say that you know what's really vital to better education are smaller classes. That the fewer students, the chances for higher quality are that much greater. Now there's a lot of lousy teachers out there. So even if they have a small class, it's going to be lousy. And there's some teachers who are great having a big class. But in general, you want small classes. That's why Lick Wilmerding, which is across the street from the Ocean Campus, which is a private school that probably costs about $45,000 a year to go to, you go by there, you're going to see classes with 50, 60 students. You usually see classes of 14 or 15 students in them. Um, other parts of this of this um, corporate agenda is a standardized education. Um, we do what are called SLOs. I won't get into those, but they, the the ideal is that anyone walking into a class, like I teach American government, the ideal is that anyone walking into American government class anywhere in the state is going to get the same curriculum, the same materials. So you standardize education, it's easy, then it makes teachers more easily to replace. And I always have this vision that eventually what is the ideal is put a class like that online, have it taught by the superstar at Stanford, and have the faculty grading papers and answering students' questions. That saves money and it, it streamlines the whole process for education. Other parts of this is the anti-union agenda, I'll get into that. Authoritarian decision making where there's no meaningful input from the college community. They'll have meetings with them, they'll hear from members of the college community, but they know what they want to do. And so they'll say, oh, we heard from the academic senate or some other sources, they said they wanted this and this. The things that they want that are similar to ours, we're going to implement them, then we'll put it in those words, and we're going to ignore everything else because we've got our agenda to carry through. They've been eliminating programs that do not lead to students getting degrees, certificates, or transferring to four-year colleges. The ideal student is someone who attends for two years full-time and gets in and out of the college right away. So programs have been eliminated for older adults and the arts for lifelong learning. In other words, programs that enrich people's lives and enrich our society by doing so, they don't want to pay for that because there's no payoff in terms of these people getting degrees and then working for businesses. At City College in particular, as a community college, it's quite unusual if you aren't familiar with it. I've taught at other community colleges. It offers an amazing diversity of programs that you don't find elsewhere in the arts, you know, journalism, and diversity studies, and on and on. Edgar could probably talk more about this. Um, most community colleges don't offer this diversity. They have the standardized introductory courses that are vital for transferring to the UCs and CSUs where they teach the same type of courses. You know, we also have a major ESL program. Again, that's not going to be done at the university. And essentially what is the attempt happening is to turn the college into a diploma mill that's and I, we could talk about the new funding requirements that they're going to be put emphasis on how many degrees students get from the college each year as a measurement of how much funding it should get. I mean, that's going to put pressure on teachers to pass through their students so that they can get the degrees, not to educate them. Education is really secondary. It's really you know getting peop working people through the system. Um, and I have to say that the policies of City College to transform and downsize it, we have to acknowledge they've been very successful. They've been extremely successful in these policies. They've accelerated, and it's been accelerating with the current administration. I've been telling people the college got its accreditation a couple years ago, but the destruction of the college has been accelerating since it got its accreditation with Rocha, who's the new chancellor. I mean, recently they claimed another budget crisis that required the cutting of even more classes. They'd already cut about 13% from the previous year. And so they immediately, unilaterally cut 300, almost 300 classes for the spring term. And it's reflected in what their desires are. 90% of the cuts were in classes for older adults, non-credit classes. The older, I'm appalled by this, because the older adult classes teach people things like balancing. Um, that's really vital to older people because they have a problems with falling. When they fall, they break bones, they get bruised, and it often kills people. By eliminating those classes, they are actually shortening the lives of senior citizens who've paid tax dollars to fund the school for all these years. And this is the message they're sending. Again, they're, 
their attempt is to get rid of 90%, 60 out of, they're only going to offer six out of the roughly 60 classes that were in the schedule already that they've eliminated even though they're in the printed schedule. Um, you know, the success is reflected in fewer faculty, fewer students. The fall enrollment of 2009 was 65,000. In fall 2018, it's about 43,000. That's like a, a third decline. And, that's, and this is the official records from the school itself. Um, who's harmed by the cuts? I've already suggested it. It's the students, it's the faculty. But one thing in particular that's really important about City College is that about 80% of its student body are students of color. 55% are women. So by reducing their economic opportunities or their opportunities to advance, um, they're really reinforcing and reproducing racists in our sexist institutions in our society that keep women and people of color in inferior positions in our society. Now, of course, some will make it, some will do well, they'll go on to Stanford, they'll be celebrated, but the vast bulk of the student body is not going to be moving upwards socially. They're going to be kept in their same position and with fewer educational opportunities. That's what the administration is doing. So when when they talk about cutting classes, I, I would hope people start saying, this is sexist and racist. You're reinforcing racist institutions. You're not calling people names like a Trump does. You aren't beating up people because you don't like the color of their skin, but you are taking away from their opportunities, which is, no, which is as bad as what you know, our blatant racists are doing as an example. Adding to the City College's problems is our gentrifying city in which there are developers who are foaming at the mouth to get their hands on the property owned by the college. And this has been recognized for a while. I came across an editorial in the Chronicle in 2013. And I'm almost done. It had this to say. One issue is the far-flung scale of the college with nine major campuses across the city. You know, serving the whole community so people don't have to get in their cars to go to school. And smaller classroom sites elsewhere. This real estate empire, so the, I don't know if you knew it, but City College is an empire, <laughs> will need to be cut back a decision that will pain those neighborhoods affected, unquote. Now more recently, in announcing this new $13 million deficit, the chancellor was talking about solving the crisis. I have his official statement, and in his official statement he said that additional revenue, there's additional revenue opportunities that include, quote, leveraging district real estate assets. Okay, which is what they've already been doing with 33 Golf and other assets that the college has. Unfortunately, opposition to these policies have been at best weak. We, a lot of us fought for restoring the Board of Trustees. During the accreditation crisis, the State Chancellor took over the college and imposed uh, a special trustee with extraordinary powers upon the college, basically who could run it as a dictator. The Democratic elected board was pushed aside. Many of us were calling for a restoration of that board, including the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco, who unanimously said they should be restored in 2014. And they have become a rubber stamp for the administration. Not much different than the, um, the U.S. Senate in terms of rubber stamping what Trump is doing. Um, another problem is the commuter school. So there's a large number. There's not a large and strong student movement, unfortunately. There's a lot of obstacles for that happening, and many students don't have the time. They have demands on their lives for work, for family issues, and you also have to understand they do these surveys that many of the students at City College endure food insecurity. They don't know that they're going to get three meals during the day, and there are many that are homeless. So you can't expect those people to have the time and energy to put into a fight against the administration when they're dealing with just day-to-day -day survival needs. Um, those who should be playing a leadership role, which is the faculty union, AFT 2121, have often been missing in action throughout the years. Um, I've written about this. I gave you links in my art on that, where I've written things. Unfortunately, the way that they organize is top-down. The leadership often is secretive. They make decisions, and then they rally the members to support them in their decisions. I never experienced where members are asked to come up with decisions about what our goals should be and what our strategy should be. I've called for years for us having a mass meeting when we lurch from one crisis to another in which members could get together and talk with each other and decide on things. They have not done this. Who's done it? 
first time I've ever experienced this, a couple weeks ago in the Diego Rivera Theater, this group called the Full-Time Caucus organized this type of meeting for the first time where people could get together and discuss things. And they are hostile towards the union. They see that the union is, is only serving the part-timers, which is a crock of nonsense. And, and, and they, they're hostile towards the union. But they, I have to give them credit. They called a mass meeting. The union has failed to do this you know, for years, even though they've been asked to do so. Um, mostly the union only narrowly, I'm part-time, uh, they only represent the narrow interests of full-time faculty. So even though the full-time caucus is hostile to them, they've gotten the best deal over the years in terms of improvements in the contract. Well, let me finish. No, we'll have comments and discussion afterwards. I'm almost done, and then, as I said, Simon and Edgar may not agree with me either. Um, so they come across, the, as far as I'm concerned, the union is largely accommodating the administration's agenda. They really have not done much to fight against. They haven't mobilized people. They just seem to have problems with the idea of mobilizing people to fight for things. They will put out announcements. They will hold their rallies, but they're usually very depressing and smallly attend attended affairs. Um, and, and they have put in place the ongoing exploitation of part-timers, which again, I could talk more about that later. Hopefully though, with the latest crisis, there may be, that may be changing. Because he pushed a grassroots campaign to bail out the college so that they could reverse the class cuts. It's taken a while, but the union is partly on board with that, and some of them are working on talking with supervisors to get the funding for the college. But where that's going to go, I'm not clear. Um, just one of the examples of their lack of transparency, they got a hold of a letter from the chancellor discouraging the city from giving money to the college. And I asked Jenny Worley and others have been asking her, she's the president, to release this letter. She still hasn't done so. And to me, this is like a smoking gun, as they always say, in investigations. You want to get his actual text saying that he, as a head of the college, he doesn't want more money for the college. He'd rather cut classes, which is his policy. Um, so I'm hoping that things will change, but I'm somewhat pessimistic. Let me turn it over to, I don't know which one of you wants Could to go first. Have comments after each speaker? And yeah. Does this guy want yeah. to speak? Yeah. And I think it'd be more dynamic. Um, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. <clears throat> well, we have to have a limit, otherwise well, we might, might run out of time. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's already, yeah. You know, well, so I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. My whole intent so of being well, here is to we answer it? questions. Yeah. Yeah. So in context of this, uh, maybe we should just finish and just say, yeah. let's go to questions. That would be the most useful time. I'm here as a resource for you guys. Thank you. Yeah. So that's my but introduction. Let's you don't want to, do you want to, the do only, you con the only context say? I want to have is you think about your questions and, and hold on to that question. I hope you can hold on to it. It's not a question, it's a comment. It's a comment. <laughs> because we incite ourselves up about the conflicts that happen both within our groups and at the college. Mm -hmm. To some extent, that is because we are trying to be an academic institution. And in context of academic institutions, we are really at a fundamental larger challenge here, which is one of top-down versus what academia is. I'm gonna channel just a little bit of Madeline here, because when I first got to the college years ago, she said, you know, the word college is based on colleagues, because the initial structure was people who are experts in their fields got together and created a community. They created a community of equals that then would have be specialists in one field. At some point, that community of however many Oxford orga organized academics had to get somebody to actually take care of the utility bills. And the model that City College holds on to is a model of department chairs and groups where we elect someone to be the leader up from the commons or from the academics. That model has been under threat for years from what's in higher education since we've actually gone to having uh, professional managers. And I think Rick touched very well on many of our issues here of having professional managers because professional managers are not managing for the commons, they're managing for a hierarchical structure, which is a corporate structure. Uh, within that, I just wanna let you guys know what I'm here today as a resource because I spent a lot of my time at City College being within the conversations, the vestiges of a communal experience that still have to be there because we have laws in California that says you must have consultation. The laws that were set up for the community college system say you cannot make academic decisions without consulting the academics. Uh, those are the types of things that are being subverted as well. 
And rather than look at the general, where do we all get together and do the hard work of saying, what's the point of our institution? Are we a community college or are we a junior college? <laughs> We're really good at being very simian and going, this is my tribe, this is not your tribe. Are you full-time or are you part-time? Are you for my political struggle or are you against my political struggle? And as long as we continue to do that, the managers are better funded, they can hire hired guns, and the agenda continues to come to City College. And like Rick said, they're being very successful. Because while we squabble amongst ourselves, they've just got a long-term agenda and they're rotating. They're not rogue. They're just hired guns, in my opinion, that come in, make their money, leave, knowing they have enough of a paycheck for the next person to come in and keep the agenda moving forward. And I put that in context as we discuss the larger issue of what was the purpose of our community college and how do we unify behind what we believe because I've just been watching strategy for the last couple of years and the strategy will not sit there and go, well, you can just have your sand pit to educate your San Franciscans in. There are people outside San Francisco that have a very definite agenda for our college. It's not our agenda, but it's definitely funded. But do you have... Okay, uh, I'm going to basically paraphrase what my two friends, colleagues have, have said earlier. One of the things that I've always thought was very special about the community college uh, system is that there's 114 community colleges and now 115 if you want to include the statewide online community college. But the community colleges were basically reflections of those communities. And, and if you know anything about the state of California, obviously uh, our San Francisco community college system is very, very different than Marin's, very different than San Jose's, very different than Los Angeles. Some of the things that uh, that makes San Francisco unique is that up until relatively recently, we were the largest community college and twofold larger than UC Berkeley. You know, we were uh, uh, distributed through many different campuses throughout the city, and those campuses often reflected the unique parts of San Francisco. We also are kind of, in terms of demographics, an old city. The average age of a San Franciscan is like 27 years of age, and again, very different than a lot of our our uh, other sectors around us. Um, we have the largest non-credit uh, section of, uh, of education in any other community college. You know, we have a huge non-credit and we're heavily uh, vested in ESL, uh, especially because of the large number of immigrants that San Francisco gets. Those sets us apart and, you know, is, uh, is uh, very difficult to negotiate when the state is trying to impose a template that fits all of the community colleges in the same way. Um, you know, some of the things that have been going on, for instance, is the passage of AB 705. And that, I think, really hurts the fact that we have a lot of students um, that have to be remediated. You know, within the Latino population, 65% of Latino high school students cannot take a transferable or a baccalaureate math English class. And now with 705, you're putting students in a higher level. Now, of course, we're, we're in theory giving them the support to pass that, but you know, the, they're shortening the sequence because what they want to do is get students out faster, whether they're prepared or not. All right, um, and, and, and again, you know, this, uh, th this new funding formula is part of that. So now we have a funding formula that will be based upon how many transfers we get and, and how many certificates we get and how many majors we get. And again, it affects different populations in different ways. Once again, I'm looking at Latinos and, you know, I, I at one time wanted to get rid of our major. We have a transfer degree, and I said, why should I have a redundant major? If you can get our transfer degree, you know, the major basically is folded inside of it, doesn't matter, we shouldn't probably have both. And all of a sudden, these counselors come to me and they said, no, you can't get rid of our major because a lot of our students don't want to transfer. And what I mean by that is that they're looking into CTE programs, they're looking into different pathways that are not necessarily the same as a four-year transfer student, and we're cutting those those out from them. So, you know, I have so many students that are interested in child development, and there is in certificates, in things that are not necessarily four-year based. 
So, at any rate, one of the things that we've done recently, and I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Villarasa from Philippine Studies, is she's taken the cuts, and I have a, a printout here of all of the classes that were cut, and took take our schedule and matched it, and essentially, we, from the credit side, we cut 107 classes, but 50% of those classes were single section offerings. All right, it's 50%, 107 classes. So that means if you were planning on taking a class that admits a GE area, but it's only that one class, and uh, you know, like, uh, I'll just go out of my department, uh, the, the uh, modern history of Latin America, there is no other option. That class is gone, and you're going to have to find another GE area that can fit that, but the one that you intended on taking is no longer being offered. 43% of our classes are evening classes. That's 92 classes, evening classes. Now that affects, there are many veils here. Most evening students are working full time. And so, and, and if you go to the centers, sometimes there's only one GE class offered that evening. So that means if that class is canceled, there's no other option within that campus that they can select to complete that GE. And it also impacts our part-timers more than any other population. Because uh, most of the sections that are in odd hours on weekends are often staffed by part-timers who have very little say about when they could choose to teach a class or anything like that. So uh, it has an adverse effect not only on the working uh, adult population, but also on our part-time uh, population. 33% of our courses, uh, 81 of them, are concurrently taught with another section. So it affects two separate populations, two separate degrees, et cetera. 13% of the courses, uh, which are 25, are short-term classes, and 11% uh, of the classes, 15 classes, are offered on weekends. So what we see is a, uh, a, a the classes that are being cut are probably going to affect the, 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 you know, certain populations in different ways. So no one was consulted with these cuts, so no one could come up and say, let's see if we can swap classes or, or something like that. Overall, overall, the older adult population is being impacted, close to 60% of their classes. Now, and this isn't new. In 2002, when we went through the accreditation crisis, I was one of the members on the new mission statement redesign. And our then uh, state appointed chancellor, Pamela Fisher, wanted to completely eliminate older adults from the mission statement. You mean 2012? 2012, 12. Yeah, sorry, 2012. Wanted to completely, and I remember her looking at me and she says, Edgar, you can't be everything to everyone. That's what she said directly to me when I was fighting for the, the fact that we have a, a population that, that's not gonna be served at all. Um, the art classes, we lost so many art classes. We lost, I, can't, I don't want to go into the numbers, music department, the PE department. Now those may seem unimportant to you, but this is what's motivating this. I'm on the enrollment management committee and they, put, they posted up two departments, I knew which two departments. One had double the number of students, but fewer transfers and fewer majors than another department. The smaller department will eventually bring in more revenue because they have more transfers and more majors. That was psychology. All right, psychology is an impacted department. Well, under this new funding formula, they're putting a value, a dollar value, on classes. It's no longer, is education important, but which one brings in more money? And, I, and that's, for an educator, that's horrible, especially for me, because I'm, I'm saying to you that I have a population that I deal with daily who often come from high school environments where they never were successful in math and English, more traditional gateway disciplines. And they have to relearn to unravel the recordings that they had 
when they came to school. And often what they do is they go to those art classes or those PE classes because that's where they've been successful in, in, in high school. And then now it becomes my job not to tell them immediately, but hopefully down the line, to, uh, to inform them that they're going to be math and English majors sooner or later. But not initially, not in the first step. They have to, they have to change that tape, change that learning about themselves and, and, uh, and then try anew. I, I've seen what I call miracles take place at City College. I've seen um, an ESL student that started here in non-credit ESL, and she wrote to me last semester saying that she was accepted full ride at a PhD in civil engineering at both Berkeley and Stanford. Mm -hmm. Full ride, but started non-credit ESL here. And, I, and that's not just once. I've seen it so many times when students just doubt themselves because of what they learned earlier and then come over here and find a new way of looking at themselves. And that's one of the things that City College provides for, uh, for our students that we'll see eliminated, we'll see that cut out. Because what we're interested in now is what a student can provide to us in terms of funding and how we're going to tailor our program so that that becomes the, the standard. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks there, are, there are so many things to talk about. <laughs> yeah. So I hope people have questions and comments. I mean, we have a lot of time. We're supposed to be, this goes till 12, but the next one doesn't start till 12.30. So yeah, yeah. hopefully we can have- 24 hours. Yeah, we got <laughs> well, according to that clock, but I don't think you want to be here that long. So Anna, do you want to speak first? Yeah. I was at a meeting with Susan Lamb that Tim Kelly mm -hmm. organized for us for about a half an hour where we were talking with her about the class cuts. Mm -hmm. He had a student join us who's going to give the big picture, but instead the student said, you know, I need these two classes in order to graduate. And so we're only meeting with her for a half hour. He spent 10 minutes going over what classes he need, and Susan Lamb said, I will see to it that those classes are offered. Mm -hmm. So they certainly have been able to succeed in getting some classes reestablished. I remember when we were doing this, there were some Japanese classes that were being cut. And so here and there, they were able to get at two or three classes restored. But in terms of the general overall problems of the downsides in the college, I, I'm sorry, it, it just it may have saved you, thankfully. It has saved other people. but. You know, you still have lots of, for example, you have a lot of part-timers. According to the union, I think it was in 2012, half the part-timers had medical benefits. To get medical benefits, you have to teach at least a 50% load. At the time, there were about 1,100 part-time instructors because the college was much bigger. Um, about two years ago, the union put out something when there's now only 800 part-timers and only a third of them have medical benefits. And I thought, you know, when they were negotiating a contract and I tried to put forward ideas, how about changing the standards so maybe you don't have to teach as much because, you know, we should have as many part-timers having medical benefits and nothing was done. They don't even put through, they don't even put forward any proposals for addressing this problem. They recognize the problem, but then they, they fail to do much. And, and again, the way that they are operating, there's different ways of organizing. Uh, let me emphasize this. There's the top-down approach where you have the, the leadership that supposedly knows the most making decisions about what's the best plan and strategy. There's another way of organizing which is called bottom-up organizing where you have the people in the grassroots making those decisions and coming up with the strategy and the goals. And when you have that latter, and maybe I'm I, making it sound idealistic, but then people own the goals and the strategy. When you own the goals and strategy, you're more likely to act upon them, as opposed to being told, this is what our goals are, and this is what you should be doing. So I, I think that's a different way of organizing, and you probably know, I mean, I've talked with people on the executive board, even members of the executive board are kept in the dark about things that the union is doing, and they aren't even told let alone the membership. And I can give you examples when the members have made decisions and then they've acted to go against them, even though the members made the decision. Love to see the union be more active and it's being more proactive rather than reactionary. And I think that we're at a point where we know the plan from our administrators, and that's to mm -hmm. continue to cut. So it, instead of waiting for the next cut, we should, we should you know, 
make a collective movement and 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 do something together. In, just quickly, in the Senate, one of the challenges we have, and we phrased it this this summer, is to be able to speak to our values. If we don't, if we we are unified on our values, the values are not things that are the day to day decision. But we're going to be killed on the day to day decision about what well, do I restore your class? Do I get your class restored? Do I get your class restored? If we're not talking about what are the things we value, and there are things that that as a college we have always valued. We've had one of the highest part time. Uh, full-time, part-time ratios trying to go towards 75% in the past, we have been massively pushed back from that. And, I and, and those are things that I would think would bring us together and instead we don't focus on the value, we focus on where's my class, what have you done for me today and it allows us to continue to be fractionated. So and let, let, me just say, oh, let me just say one other thing about this is that in the recent round of cuts department chairs have been told that if you have a class that a student needs for graduating that we have cut then we'll, we'll, this is what we'll do. You cut another class to restore that class that's been cut. So in other words it's like you screw one group of people in order to help on another. Um, so. It is a classic strategy of divide and conquer. That's that's what we're facing. Yeah. Okay, Steve. Yeah. Well, the, you know the a whole accreditation crisis, the attack on community college of San Francisco was not an accident. It was a planned part of privatization and destruction of City College. That's what was going on. They knew what they were doing. It was corrupt. It's true, but they had an organized plan. Now, when that happened, there was a meeting at the. LBGT Center, and there were about 120 people there. Right? Many of you were probably at that. And at that time, I suggested we need a campaign, an education campaign, about privatization, about corporatization of community calls. It's not just a one shot deal. We were told at that time by Elisa that let's wait until after we get our accreditation back. You know, let's wait until we, we finish this accreditation thing. Well, the reality is you can't fight just issue by issue. You have to have a plan to involve everyone and to educate everyone so they're all on the same page about what they're really trying to do, which is destroy public education and community colleges. That hasn't been done. And the fact that we haven't mentioned the California Federation of Teachers here is a problem. Because this is going on at other community colleges throughout the state. San Mateo, all kinds of community testing, commercializing, basically commodifying community college education with, with all these programs, Student Success Task Force. Now the union did statewide oppose this, these bills, but there was no political campaign. In fact, in San Francisco, there was no campaign to demand that the representatives oppose it. I mean, you would think that this bill, which is harming us and is being used as a justification by the chancellor for why they have to make the cuts, they said, we're not getting the funding for these things. Well, you would think, well, let's repeal this bill. It's reactionary, it's attacking our community college. There hasn't been a call by the union or the CFT that we've got to repeal this thing. It's an attacking all community colleges. So we have to put this in a broader context. I think that, you know, uh, that we need a campaign to get all the community colleges together, to start linking up. There's tremendous power in the community colleges if we're united. If all the community colleges in California get together, there's tremendous power there. But you have to have a plan and a strategy to do that. It's not going to happen by itself. And I was, remember being at a CFT convention in San Francisco where they didn't even have a, a, a class on privatization and corporatization. Now, how can a union at a convention, statewide convention, not have a class to say, let's talk about privatization and corporatization of education? That's the first step in being able to confront it. So I think there has to be an education campaign. The last point I want to make about the union. Now, the union did oppose uh, hiring Rocha. And, you know, despite, you know, the protest, he was hired, despite what he'd done at Pasadena Community College. The fact of the matter is, after all these uh, <laughs> lies by him, treachery, uh, dishonesty, he's flagrantly lied. He could be fired for cause. I mean, he's made statements that actually could allow his firing to be for cause. You can't make a false statement about a situation. And that's cause for firing, termination. Now that has to be a campaign. He has to be terminated. Now, what is going to replace him? And some people have argued, like uh, Madeline, well, if you fire him, what are you going to do? Right. Okay, that's the, the and I would say, uh, and I talked it with Rick, we put the department chairs in charge of the college. They're the ones that 
really know what's going on and have them be the directors of the college. We have to have a, a, a rank and file array, the, the people doing education coming together and making decisions to have these executives, corporate hitmen, which is really what they are, in charge is is not going to work. So that's my position. Simon, did you want to? Do either one of you want to respond? I, to anything? Okay. I have some responses, but I want to hear more from people in the audience. Okay. Here, the important oh, ones. Oh, Listen, I think these points are very well yeah. taken, and I, I agree with everything that's been said on this by the panel. Um, now I'm going to talk for a second about Jackie Speer, the con member of Congress from this region. And I consider her part of the military industrial technolo technology complex. So I have a lot of problems with that woman. However, she, by calling that forum in the Diego Rivera Theater at a time when the, poli the local elected politicians were scared stiff, the faculty, by and large, were scared stiff, Everybody was trembling about losing our accreditation. And her initiative to get that forum, in, you know, well-attended forum, was very important, as was Dennis Herrera's lawsuit, you know, the city attorney of San Francisco against the accreditation committee was very important. So we... We can beat up on the union, and I agree with all the points Rick makes, but we must also understand the context that was going on. And I'll always Agreed. be grateful to Jackie Spear for that. <laughs> I, uh, sorry, moderate. You know, um, as someone who uh, frequents this particular campus, uh, not for classes, but uh, to eat, um, which may sound funny, but um, it seems that we, you know, we, we must look to where the students are and where the would-be students are. Here, if you, if you ask at the, at the cafeteria at City College Ocean or here at the cafe, you can find out and anyone can find out when are there the largest gatherings of students to grab, grab a bite, have a coffee, whatever. And, and that way maximize when to do outreach to these groups. Also, since we're talking about what would be considered um, adult education um, with the non-credit classes, Groups like Senior Senior and Disability Action Network. I think that's its current name, right? Senior Disability Action. Yeah. Senior you know, SDM. and other groups, senior centers, <clears throat> because this is where people are, you know. And the reality is that I I started taking classes at City College when there were a hundred thousand students. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of those were from outside San Francisco. Um, also, that you know that I know it, to get solidarity within City College is a challenge, but also for students to be able to take classes here, and if they happen to be in San Mateo, take some in Skyline or something like that. Also, making sure that as policies, if you're teaching at two or three different community college colleges, that shouldn't be three employers. That should be one employer, in the sense that you can get benefits. I don't think you can do that, right? Because uh, there's two things there. One, you're talking about going to our students and getting student outreach. The amount of money that has been spent on marketing and outreach in this year's budget, zero. Um, as far as the agenda goes of making us a smaller college, one of the ways that we do that, or the strategy has been, focus completely on degree completion so that we don't deal with our low enrollment numbers. We are a unique uh, a college here in that the majority of people in San Francisco come and work here for the day and then leave. So they are highly mobile. Uh, the community colleges are set up not to compete with each other, but if you look at at least 30% of our students come from outside of San Francisco, uh, and right now we're 
been trying to push to try to get people to start getting more students in the door and the only thing we've heard from the college is it's all degrees that come out of the door. There was a study that was done last year that showed that if you look at graduation rates, 30% of community college students throughout the nation transfer meaning they don't register like I, if I have 100 students come in the door, I only give degrees to 25% of them. But 30% more are just going from one college to another, just what you said, to San Mateo, to someplace else. And so they don't show up on any, anyone's success statistics. We're just offering a service. That's a challenge for the community college system. And I, I'm just tagging in the last thing that you said, which was if someone teaches at three co community colleges, that should be one employer. That's tricky because that's exactly what the state of California wants. We are set up as a system that has local controls for all our districts. Uh, the policies of San Francisco are set by the San Francisco Community College Board of Trustees. Sacramento would love to have 115 community colleges under the Board of Governors, and they would use that as an excuse to say we are one employer so that they can tell us, stop, stop offering a field course in the uh, 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 by ecology of the Golden Gate Recreation Area, you should only be offering general biology the same class in all the community college systems. We got kind of a, a challenge there in that sense, so I just want to address I, I, that. I meant it as... Yes, no, as I totally agree with you. Know, well, you're working I, for... I, I'm not know, disagreeing. Yeah. I'm saying there's a, it's like a devil's bargain because as soon as we say, wow, this is our problem, you're so fractionated and there's so many freeway flyers and maybe if we made it all one system, and yet you look at what the money has come into Sacramento and it's exactly what they're trying to do. And the other thing I would just say from my perspective is don't assume that all the state of California is behind every community college system. There are community college systems in the state of California that hate CCSF. That's how we ended up with the student success funding formula. It's really easy at the state level to pit ourselves off against each other. I can go to the very conservative regions and say it's those liberals in San Francisco, and I can get a, a, a bill in Sacramento that screws us over. We can do it here locally. We do it in Sacramento. It's human nature. Weird thing. Go ahead. Who's moderating? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are. I want to check. That's why I'm checking. I don't want to take over here. Who's moderating? You're too used to being a teacher. I know. It's okay. Uh, yeah, check me. Really, uh, ignorant questions, so you have to excuse this, because I don't really understand the interaction between the Board of Trustees and State Board Per Se and like all these other things. But um, beyond the like sort of cash infusion that's described here to just save their classes locally, given that the makeup of the board is going to change next year uh, to a you know progressive majority, um, what can be done very specifically at the legislative le level locally to change like the administrative structure or like stop this terrible <laughs> sequence of events from happening? Like, what do we actually tell Haney to do? Have it, I, well, I think one I is that this is a very, one of the arguments that we're making for this infusion of money is to, the excuse of the chancellor was, we had to cut all these classes because of our deficit. And we don't even know if the deficit's real. It's like, you know, it's just one crisis from another. It, it came su very suddenly. I mean, last, last spring, it was first 11 million, then 30 million, and by the summer, the Board of Trustees was saying it's 50 million. Uh, I mean, you, you aren't talking about a big budget. I think the whole school's budget is 200 to 300 million dollars. So that's a huge margin error level that they're making. Uh, I mean, so, you know, just give you some specific things. Um, I mean, the campaign now is just to get emergency funding to force the chancellor to reverse the cuts. And one of the things that's interesting about the cuts this time around is a lot of the people being cut are full timers. And that's going to create more nastiness because some of the full timers are then exercising their bumping rights to take over classes of part timers. So it's another divide and conquer thing. And so you just tell them, look, look at this is a wealthy city. It's inexcusable that you can't come up with a three less than three three million dollars to save the job the opportunities of the students. Um, so that's one thing. That's but this is just short term. This is an emergency. The next thing that you have to make sure of is that the union over the years has been very active in getting more money for the college. Prop, you might remember Prop A from 2012. Um, so you throw more, but you throw more money at these people. They don't necessarily use it for the purpose that's intended. There was money from Mark Leno when he was a state senator to give the college funding for three years at the level that it would be getting had it not lost all these students in 2012, from two, after 2012. And the idea is that they were supposed to increase enrollment. 
Instead, what they constantly are doing is sabotaging more students enrolling at the college. So I don't, I don't have the right answer. To me, it's always like a mass movement. You've got to get a mass movement with demands, and you put, you know, you attack these people if they don't come through. One of the major disappointments is that we keep on being told nationally that we got to get rid of Trump, that the Democrats are the alternative. Well, that alternative has been in absolute power in California for a number of years. And what have they been doing? They haven't been funding public education to the degree that was, it was funded when Schwarzenegger was governor. I mean, I did some of my links, I've discussed that. But let me also say about the sabotaging enrollment, which is, we haven't really brought that up today. They keep on doing that. So in the spring, for example, they didn't release the schedule of classes until after students left, left for the summer. And then, in addition, they put this blatantly on their homepage. We are only distributing the printed schedule in the main library and at all the different campuses. I mean, they used to mail it out to people, but they aren't even distributing it in places that you know, people are going to pick it up and say, oh, here's these classes. Great, I'm going to sign up for one of them. So that's discouraging enrollment. And now with what the chaos that they've done now, so this is the current printed schedule, but 300 classes roughly have been eliminated. So you're someone going through the schedule and say, hey, I want to take this, this, and that class. You go to sign up, and that class has been canceled. And so it, it adds to the troubles. And then you've got the online registration system, which is screwed up all the time and not working properly, adding further discouragement. I'll just say one last thing about that, which is that I think for the last three or four terms, on the first day of classes when you have ads, you have an ad code, and that system has, has crashed on the first day of classes for adding more students. Now they've come up with some other new way of doing it, and I just think it's going to be a nightmare because it's probably not going to work, and there's just going to be more chaos at the school. So while they're simultaneously cutting classes, they're simultaneously discouraging enrollment that's going to be used as an excuse to cut even more classes. So those are just a few, but I, I can't, you know, I'm not giving you a full answer to your can, question. Can I attempt yeah. to just add uh, just information? Well, you keep saying they. Let's be clear here. The community college system in San Francisco is run locally at a board level. We call them the board of trustees. Uh, that board of trustees only had one person up for election last cycle, Ivy Lee, who was reelected. I think there are four of them coming up for the next election cycle. Uh, the, that is a special relationship between the city and uh, the board of trustees because, this, just to be perfectly blunt, the board of trustees has become a political stepping stone for people wanting to play city politics. Mm -hmm. The board of supervisors is who the college is now going to, asking to bail us out because of what we're perceived as a budget shortfall, and I tend to think it's real. Um, the whole thing is under governance of the state of California because the community college system, while we have a local board of trustees, also has uh, a chancellor of the state community college board that governs all the colleges. So much of the political tension is about local control versus state control. Uh, at local control, we fought to get our local board in, and it seems like right now they have hired an administration that is pushing full steam ahead with what a state agenda is. And there hasn't been a lot of pressure put on the local board. They've been pretty well isolated by our administration. So if you're looking for places locally to look, you can look to your supervisor, because we're asking them to money now to bail us out again. But you can also, if you have long-term memory, hold out to the next board of trustee elections, because the organizing at the local level is what's going to determine whether that progressive change we have at the supervisors is now reflected in actual progressive change in the board of trustees. May I, on follow-up, is, yeah, it's, the board of trustees is a stepping stone. You get, you get citywide exposure, even if you lose, you get citywide exposure and so if you run in your district, you've got more name recognition. And it's also about holding people accountable. It's very hard to actually have someone be responsible in public governance for running and keeping things happening. I have to add, though, that I live in Oakland. 
and I've heard this narrative about the Oakland Peralta District Board, and you often will elect people who sound great, they're gonna be fighters for you, and then they get into that position and they're huge disappointments. So even the local board of City College, the last major election, two people got elected, which was Chanel Williams, who was one of the leaders of the fight, when we were trying to save the college, she was really front and center. And Tom Temprano, who's also seen as an ally. So people were saying, oh, we finally have four, quote, progressives on the board, which were those two, Rizzo and Davila. And over and over again, these people get into these positions and something happens where they, they just get sucked into the system and they don't stand up and fight for for the for people, so yes, it would be good to elect some new people to the board. But you got to find people, and you got to you know you got to make sure that they will carry through in what they're promising. I mean, I think I don't know Preston, who just got e elected to the board of supervisors. Sounds like he's going to be a great member of the board of supervisors. But it, you know, when you get into the system, what happens to you? I mean, the our board is constantly talking with the administration. They don't listen to others that much, or they may hear them and they'll even say the right things, but then, you know, when they make decisions, they are, again, not doing what we would expect and want from them. And so they're just, you know, one disappointment after another. I mean, just the fact that they hired Rocha, given his record, and frankly, the union came out against him, but it's partly because Steve and I started discovering information about it and publicizing it. Now, I don't know if we were responsible for the opposition from the union, but it took them a long time before they started speaking out. It's only about a week before the decision to hire him came out because his record in Pasadena, and I have the link on there, is just absolutely atrocious. And he lied, too. He always said that he increased enrollment while he was there, and you look at the state figures, enrollment went down doing a Senate thing. I'm taking a speaker list because yeah, I'm trying to figure out who's... My name's Susanna, and I was a part-time teacher in the business department for 12 years. I retired at the end of 2014. And the question I... And I was out of the country for four years. And now I'm back, and I went to the last Board of Trustees meeting and the budget meeting this week. Um, and this new formula for funding, it used to be that we got funds that were based on full-time equivalent. So if you had a student that took one class, it would count as one-fifth of a full-time equivalent student. Now I understand that the formula includes whether people get certificates and or trans they transfer. But is there not still a component for full-time equivalent? Yeah. What is the formula now, I guess, is my question. Um, so there was much opposition to this student success funding formula. The original funding formula had it phased in, and by next year it was supposed to be only 60% of you got for just having the student present, 20% you had for whether they were a bog waiver or a low-income student by various metrics, and 20% uh, uh, was going to be what we call performance-based funding. That's Which where you look. That? That's a, the, the graduation rate. Mm -hmm. uh, when we lost, I say we collectively because the Senate opposed it, many <coughs> unions opposed it, um, when they lost that the student success funding formula was going to be implemented, then lobbying immediately went into ameliorating that. So the current formula that we're operating under is 70% just enrollment, so the same as FETS, 20% mm -hmm. uh, whether they are bog waiver or areas of need, and 10% by this performance funding. Uh, there's current lobbying going on to try to adjust that even further. Uh, the oversight group is looking to make adjustments for first-time college students, saying that they should get a little bit more in there. And our former uh, finance chief is now interim at, at uh, Chabot, and a group of Bay Area colleges have been lobbying at two meetings to try to get a cost of living factor adjusted in there because it's more expensive to be in San Francisco. None of that has gone through. That's all in the political sausage making. But currently, as it exists in the funding formula, if it were implemented, 70% is still just people in seats. So doing outreach just to get students, whether they're going to transfer or not, still would get, still the would get us the 70%. And our, our, our balance of whether that's going to float the college is something we have not discussed because we have been under a very 
poor pointed administrative push to go, let's cut all of these classes, let's rearrange the college, because the only thing that matters is that performance-based funding. It's an agenda-driven management so strategy. That's basically a lie then, because it's only 20% of the funding that is based on that success. 10%. 10. 10% 10. 10. 10. 10. 10. now is based on performance-based funding. But I think we're held harmless for a couple of years. Yes. Now, our finances are, are in a hold harmless because they hadn't implemented how they were going to phase this in. Uh, there was a, a paper that came out, a white paper on this funding formula saying you should only do it when enrollments are robust at the community college system. In other words, we could only take change if it makes sure it's not disruptive of the core missions of the college. Uh, that was ignored. All community colleges are decreasing in enrollment right now, and we're still shoving this funding formula forward right now at a time in which we're kind of further destabilized. I think I was just watching, I think yeah, people Jean, haven't spoke yet. Jean had her next. I, I want to go back to what Rich was talking about and the concerns regarding the selling out of the trustees, even if you thought they were going to be progressive, they turn out to Speak be Speak up, more. please. They turn out, the selling out, what Rick was talking about regarding the selling out of the trustees, once they get elected, they don't maintain their progressive position anymore. So my question is, in order to solve some of these huge problems that you're talking about, are there structural changes that need to be made and that go above and beyond just picking people who look like they'd be the right people in the positions of authority? You're asking me that? Well, you're the one. I, I, the I would be happy. Answer, yeah. I would be happy to see another form of administrative structure. Like, why do we need one chancellor who's authoritarian, basically making decisions for the whole college? I would, as Steve was saying, it start, we ought to start looking at alternatives. Like, put, the department chairs at City College, and this is probably more unique at City College, are like administrators. I mean, they decide the schedules, the, the classes, and make a lot of those kinds of decisions. They know the college a hell of a lot better than these outsiders who come in who are basically bean counters. Who are, you know, count, you know for them, a successful class is a class that's has no empty seats in it that brings in the most, because that's going to bring in the most money of students who are going to graduate and get in and out in two years. That's, that's the ideal. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm in, I think we need major changes in our whole society because we have to... But what would you do with City College? That would well, temporarily, I would say put the Academic Senate, look at putting the Academic Senate and the department chairs more in charge making decisions and let them plan out the the schedule. Let them, you know, it means giving them more responsibilities, they need more release times, instead of leaving it up to the bean counters. And would, would the authority of the Board of Trustees change in this? In this well, situation? it's probably not legal, what I'm suggesting. <laughs> and because I think there's probably these laws there, that require there could be a change certain in the structure. Things. I mean, you could have elected students, elected staff, elected faculty on the board as part of the board. But it requires a, a, a structure, it does require a structural change. But What's happened, they've grabbed the education system, they've always been in control of it, and now they're destroying it. They're consciously destroying it. And they know what they're doing, they're not stupid. And uh, there is no mass movement, there's no, I mean, I'm glad he raised the spear. Spear called a meeting. Well, the union and the community should be calling meetings on what we're going to do with this crisis. Are we going to have a community college? Because at the rate they're going, there isn't going to be a community college left. They're going to sell off the properties and that's going to be it. They're moving quickly. Mm -hmm. So this is an emergency situation which requires all the community, the staff, the faculty coming together and saying, what, what are we going to do to solve this? The other thing is the, the Democrats in San Francisco and in California have a $21 billion surplus. Okay, why aren't they talking about that? Why isn't the union talking about the, the state fully funding the community college system with this massive budget surplus, and you've got all these billionaires in San Francisco, and they don't have money for community college? I mean, they don't have money because they don't want money for community college. That's why they don't have money, because they have money for many other things. The union has to make that an issue, and the students have to make that an issue. That's why we formed HEAT, I mean, as a way of educating people about how we're going to deal with the system problem, because it's not just roaches, it's not just bad individuals. I, I'd just like to get granular on your question real quick here, and I want to get to the next question. So at the last board meeting, Ivy Lee was one of the only trustees who asked for an independent financial authority to come in. Mm -hmm. uh, that wasn't passed forward to the board in general. She's the chair of a subcommittee on the budget. So when you talk about structural changes, one of the things that has been come up in this moment of crisis is you are now in charge of everything. It's a top-down model. The administration holds all the cards. They have a history now of showing that they can't put together a budget. 
They can't follow a budget. That's why they're creating the next crisis. So if you were looking for a, a, an iron to strike right now, it wouldn't be bring someone else in. It would be, yes, take us over by ourselves. Because if we don't, within the next six months, the state is going to be happy. If we go below our 5% reserve, they will send another special trustee in here quickly. And they will do it now on our dime because they changed state law over the last year to say, if we have another special trustee, it's not paid for by the state, it's paid for locally. So if anything we would push at for governance right now, it would be to get somebody independent that would be responsible to faculty, constituent groups, and administration for just reporting what the actual money is and what the actual budget is. So Ivy Lee's proposal for an audit did not get... It went to a backroom deal and then it was went nowhere because the board has been very well controlled by the administration. They, 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 there's a good divide and conquer strategy that happens within the board. board. Yeah, yeah. rubber and, stamp board. Yeah. Besides the structural change, you really need to change the members of the board. That is the structural yeah. change. That well, is... Changing the names of the... Changing the members... Or changing who sits on the board and who has influence and vote. If you were to change right now and say we're going to bring in someone outside that respond that is responsible to the board of supervisors but sits on the board for financial information that would disrupt the, the, the core issue right there. Once again this this uh, there are many levels and many layers that we have to uh, look at these issues through and certainly we have to remember that in 2012 when we were under state uh, governance our board of trustees were taken to many retreats and told not to micromanage. So, you know, that very, you know, uh, agreement meant that very few of them actually know the, the ongoings of what's happening within the college. And, and b besides that, you know, I always ask this question, are you a friend of City College or a friend of the City and County of San Francisco? And I would have to say that the majority of our current administrators are more friend of the city than they are about the internal workings of City College. I, city I, College. I, I, and, oh, and the sorry. last thing I, I want to say is that, you know, this, this system is such that we're, you know, we need the four due progressive, hopefully, uh, uh, board of trustee members. This election is critical. Rizzo told me that the board, they allowed this humiliation to take place when they were being restored to power. They were told that they had to go through training for about a year. Now, I don't know of any elected official that would allow to be trained. And he said to me, so it's not, you know, I can't document this, that their training was basically to follow what the administration, approve what the administration wants them to do. And that's that was the goal of the training. And as someone else pointed out, these people are politically ambitious. They do not want to bang up against powerful people within the city. And they see that their path to, um, to move ahead politically is to not make waves while they're on the board of, at City College, because if they do so, they're going to be seen as someone that we don't want serving on the board of supervisors. And again, three of the seven people have already run or tried to run for the board of supervisors. One of them, I'll say her name because I couldn't believe that she said this to us one day. I was at a meeting with Thea Selby, a private meeting of people that she doesn't know. She had run for the board of supervisors, lost to London Breed, I think she told us she came in second place. She actually came in fourth place. And she said, after that, I was looking around for something to do. And I saw that I could run for the Board of Trustees at City College. And I mean, that may be what you think, but you don't say that to strangers. That, that is just like, you got to be a political idiot to say something like that. Because she got elected. Well, yeah, yeah, and she got the endorsement of the union. Even though at a union endorsement meeting, she made the comment that, oh, part-timers and full-timers are paid the same hourly rate. Like, come on, you're going to be running to serve in this institution and you don't know something as basic as that, which has been an issue around the country for years. Um, and, and that's the kind of people that get onto the board. And again, there's disappointments. I mean, you just got to keep their feet to the fire. S Steve mentioned something really important, though, which was when the accreditation crisis happened, there was an emergency meeting in the Castro, overseen by Mandelman, who'd be on the board later, and now is on the board of supervisors, and Lisa Messer. They had people out the doors that couldn't even fit in the room. I would say there were probably more like two or 300 people who were fired up and angry. 
And what did they do? They had people vent for two hours, and then at the end of the two hours, they said, oh, maybe we ought to do something and organize something. And that to me was like, in retrospect, that was an opportunity that was lost, and that's kind of the approach of Mandelman. Let people vent, you know, express their anger, because then they aren't going to cause disruptions later on. And you know, and he was president of the board so for a while. And just organize the actions that are already there, just so you know. There is a uh, board of supervisors is being lobbied right now by the union for CHEF funding. That's community higher education funding. That's a long-term solution of to try to set aside city money for the classes at City College that the City College community values. Uh, so that's in the works right now. In November. Uh, in November. Uh, next November, they're targeting next November in the ballot. Uh, there is uh, a, a Prop 13 splitting of the payroll that's happening right now. You see petitions going around right now. That's another way to look at the long term. Over the short term, this is where the immediate ask for money is coming in because the actions of cutting the classes are happening right now. That's the this heat is the petition. heat. This is the heat information. No, this is heat. The union is different. Yeah. The union is calling for money. It's not even clear if they're calling for a grant or bridge funding. Pass that around. That's that's like a. Yeah, oh, take one. It was on the tables here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm passing it around because I brought it for this meeting. Um, so, so this is different. The, yeah, the union thing is saying they're asking for money, but they don't make clear if they're asking for a short-term loan, which is called a bridge loan, or a grant. If they do a bridge loan, the college will get some funding, but then they've got to pay it back. And the city, again, has a $12 billion budget. They're sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars in reserves, and they're being asked just a few million dollars. Rick, to clarify, so, this says a $2.7 million. Well, that's, that's the union. So well, okay. well we, but you we, saw Jenny. Yeah, I, don't know, I, I don't know what the ordinance is going to say. We, our position, Heath's position, is they should just appropriate the money. And, and But the problem is, again, and that's why we're calling for an independent audit, even if they appropriate the money with Rocha and company, they could say, look, you know, we use it for other things. I mean, there's no requirement to go to staff and faculty and keeping the classes going. So the other thing is, you have to get rid of the academic senate. You have to get call for the resignation of, of Rocha and have another plan. Who are you going to put in? Because this guy is a wrecking operation. You know? so, I mean, and so that's I'm, I'm going to address this one, Steve, because asking for it and asking for someone else to do it is not the same as the community organizing around it. As a community member, you have a local trustee. Thanks. Have you spoken to your local trustee? We have members of our board of trustees right now that are getting a lot of pressure put on them about if you just say get rid of Rocha, their answer is going to be who do we put in his place? And that's why we said. And that's why asking them right now, who are you thinking about putting in his place? To put the pressure on them still so that it becomes easier when that thing comes from the Senate of the no confidence. When things come forward, the trustees have already broken from Rocha and are, are, are have a plan in place. Oh, I, That's something the community okay. can now start to ask of their trustees immediately and organize. Well, now that Rocha has said, according to this unreleased document, that he's against the $2.7 million because he has a long-term plan to downsize City College, I mean, that is very clear now that Rocha should not be in charge of community college. Okay, that's a no-brainer. So there has to be action to get rid of Rocha. Now, who replaces Rocha? That has to be an organization of the community, of the staff, and the faculty. But I, I think we can't say bring in somebody else who will be appointed, who so will be doing the same thing as Rocha. Here's, I mean, here, that's my subtlety right now, and I'm trying to be very clear about this, Steve, is that if you ask for him to be removed and say it is City College's job to find the next administrator, you're going to get the next administrative hydra head coming in. Uh -huh. If you go to the community and say, trustee, I am watching you. Who are you putting in because you answer to me as a community member? Organization has to go outside community college at this point. It's got to be connected to the cities and communities of San Francisco. Because if it stays within city college, we will just rotate another head in. Our classes have been cut within the communities. Well, if you keep it just as a city college thing, but if it's also talk about the state funding and what, what it's doing with the state legislation, I mean, I don't accept what they're saying, but the fact is they're arguing that they're following the state new state laws. So that has to be part of the campaign. We're going to oppose those state laws, which are basically aimed at corporatizing and destroying public community colleges. So, I mean, there has to be a program that ties these things together and the issue of privatization and corporatization. So that's... I agree. That's one of the frustrating things at the college. 
um, there is not an education campaign to tell people what's going on. And again, people don't like me saying this, but I hold the union partly responsible for that. For example, on more than one occasion recently, they have said the budget deficit is real. I've been told by union members the budget deficit is real, but they don't explain it. I mean, I'm willing to hear the details, but they don't explain it. The stuff about Free City is also hugely problematic. One of the big problems is that if a student drops out of class after the second or third week because of a job demand or something that goes on in their life where they have to drop, I don't know if students are that aware that they're going to be charged the full tuition, which to me is criminal. If you have free tuition, you don't turn around and charge people because they have some problem arises in their family and they have to drop out of a class. It also puts teachers in a terrible situation because I have students who stop showing up to class. If I drop them, I'm going to charge. It's going to cost them 150 bucks. If I don't drop them, they get an F on their record. It's like you know, damned if you do and damned if you don't. I mean, that free city program has huge flaws in it, and. Though, you know, I've written about that. I, I guess you know, I have a handout for people about the crisis and some articles that I've written that covers it. And again, there needs to be more education for people. And I think even teachers are uninformed. I was at a party about six months ago with a person who's a full-time teacher. And I was talking to her about the Balboa Reservoir property owned by the PUC being turned over to this for-profit housing developer. She was clueless about that. She had no idea. And I'm like, where have you been? And, and so, there's just, so it's not just students, but it's a lot of the faculty are terribly uninformed. What, what kind of power do you think students have outside of contacting the Board of Trustees? I know there are multiple student groups that I was going to try to hook up with you afterwards. Uh, HEAT has students on it. There is a student assembly that's working within the union. There is another group that is just working on within student governance to try to make sure that students have easier access onto all our participatory governance committees. In other words, just trying to say, where do you direct students? Well, if you have extra, why don't you get into the workings of the government of the college and be more of the people that we're saying, if you're required to have a meeting with us, we want to make sure the student seats are filled. The other thing is, I mean, there. basically, to cut 280 classes is a strike issue. Should be a strike issue. That's what the union should be talking about. Whether they do it or not is another question. But they don't mention the word strike. Why? They're basically going to butcher the university or the college. So that has to be raised, striking students and the faculty. And so